So I just got back from the US, my country of origin. And uh, politically, it's a mess. <laughs> and I'm not talking about the politicians necessarily, about the leaders, but the people. Dinner conversations easily, easily turn into bickering and fighting and divisive confrontation. Or if everyone kind of gets along at the meal, then it just turns into slander fest so easily. And there's a weariness, too, that you can see in the eyes, I think, of a lot of people. A weariness, maybe you can even see it on the news sometimes in the faces of the people talking about what's going on. And there's a weariness in our home, too. My six-year-old son asks about his president. And where do I start? Do I explain to him what hush money is and why the hush money is being paid? I've got two different scenarios to pick from with that one. Do I explain to him how collusion isn't necessarily treason? Or do I start with talking about why everyone is talking about children being separated from parents? Whether or not these are all false, ex false accusations, the whole drama at the end of the day tells us what kind of a state I think America is in. And so it is so good to be back home in Canada, where there's no drama, right? Where I'm not scared to let my kid watch the news with me. This weekend's headlines, Fredericton shooting, and a special, a pairing special on four decades of Canadian police homicides. An exclusive interview with that serial killing nurse a spat between Canada and Saudi Arabia and how other countries are distancing themselves from us. Welcome to the world. Welcome to the world, Elroy. We live in a world that seems to be spinning out of control and maybe you want to know, along with many other people, how, God, what can you do for me in the midst of this messy, spinning out of control world? You call yourself a savior. Can you save us from this mess that we are in? Have you caught yourself grumbling to your God, not just to other people, about this world? What's interesting is that this isn't the first time in history. God, our gospel for today starts out with the words the Jews began to grumble. And when John, the writer of the gospel, uses that word grumble, he wants those of you that maybe have some of those Bible studies stowed away in your heads to think of another time that there was some grumbling going on in the Bible. In fact, if I were to tell you a story that goes something like this, a crowd gathers in the wilderness following their leader, they're hungry, and the leader miraculously provides food for them, what story could I be telling? The Exodus, right? And that's exactly what John wants us to be thinking about. And so, let me remind you of the story. Moses is sent by God to Egypt to bring the children of Israel out of slavery, the slavery that they were in there. And he brings them out of Egypt with many different miracles and all the plagues and everything that goes along with that. They're following a pillar of fire and smoke through the Red Seas. But then between Egypt and Israel, there's this vast wilderness that God then leads his people through. And as they make their way through the wilderness, they run out of food. And they begin to grumble against God. And they begin to say, it was better for us, God, to be slaves in Egypt than to die out here in the wilderness. And God's response, manna from heaven. He sends bread, literally, from heaven to appear and feed them for the rest of their journey through the wilderness. Does the grumbling stop there? No, in fact, the story of the Exodus is really the story of the Israelites grumbling over and over and over again and God simply graciously giving them more and more gifts as they make their way through the wilderness. And so when we hear this word grumbling here, 
What John is making us think of is that the grumbling that's taking place here, it's not all that different than the grumbling that's taking place with the Israelites. When the Israelites grumbled, it was despite the fact that they were surrounded with great signs and wonders, despite all the evidence that God was on their side, they still continued to grumble against God. And now, what are the Jewish people doing out here in another wilderness? Jesus has just fed them, 5,000 people, with a few loaves of bread, and we find them grumbling again. And so this grumbling that's taking place, it's not simply grumbling about the facts, but in spite of the facts. This is a hostile, willful unbelief among the people. One, despite the fact that they have someone here giving them all the signs that they need. And what are they grumbling about? The Jewish crowd literally says that they are grumbling about Jesus saying, I am the bread that came down from heaven. So if your friend walks up to you and your friend tells you, I am the bread that came down from heaven, what would bother you the most? The fact that he's claiming he's bread? Or the fact that he's claiming that he came down from heaven? What's interesting is that at this point, what's bothering the Jewish people most is that God is claiming that he's from heaven. In fact, this is what they say. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Why are they grumbling? They've got someone that's doing these signs, that are doing wonders, that is clearly showing that this possibly could be someone sent from heaven. Maybe we ought to start following him and listening, being a little bit more patient with him. Why are they grumbling? The reality is because if this is really someone sent from heaven, if this is the Savior that God is sending, it's not really the Savior that they want. It's not really the Savior that they're looking for. See, Jewish politics at this time was a mess. Jewish politics at this time was spinning out of control. The Jewish people had just been under the thumb of four different ruling people. They were prisoners of their own land, first under the Babylonians and then the Assyrians and then under the Greeks and now under the Romans. And the Romans had put puppet kings in charge of them, violent kings that were doing terrible things. And the governor that was in charge of Israel at this time right now, historians outside of the Bible describe him like this. They say that he was vindictive, bad-tempered, corrupt, constantly insulting people, living a licentious lifestyle, clearly committing crimes, always left untried. That's Pontius Pilate. That's someone 2,000 years ago. And the Jews are saying to Jesus, what can you do for us? And we echo them today at times, don't we? What can you do for us, God? And when things politically just stay just as, they mess, just as messed up as they were, maybe we call out and go to God and say, you call yourself a king, but take a look at your kingdom. Just take a look at it and tell me that you're in control. But just as we know that the Jewish people grumbling against God was a sin, just like their Israelites generations earlier grumbling against God was a sin, we know that our grumbling against God is a sin too. We need to repent for our grumbling. That's part one of our message this morning. I certainly need to repent for my grumbling. How does Jesus respond? His words to the Israelites or to the Jewish people, stop grumbling among yourselves, he answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. So he first says, the Father sent me, so he's doubling down on it. Jesus is saying, I am sent from heaven. I am the Father's real Son sent from heaven. But then he goes on, and he says something very strange. He says that God the Father draws people to him. So to be saved from our sins, we need to be drawn in, not make a decision, but God himself somehow makes a decision and draws us in. The struggling, grumbling, resisting will of the human here 
is placed in juxtaposition to the father drawing in that grumbling person. There was a journalist uh, a few decades back that was famous for interviewing famous people that became Christians and then writing articles about it. And one of the people that the journalist interviewed was C.S. Lewis. So C.S. Lewis, um, if you don't know him, a uh, very famous Christian writer in the 20th century, he wrote The Chronicles of Narnia, uh, that beautiful kind of allegorical story, Christian story. He also wrote Mere Christianity. And so he's being interviewed by the journalist, and the journalist is trying to get C.S. Lewis to say, I made a decision. But C.S. Lewis is not having it. He refuses. And instead, he uses the phrase, I was decided upon. And that becomes the title of the article that the journalist writes. Instead, Lewis describes his conversion. Instead of making a decision, he describes his conversion as kicking and screaming and that he literally needs to be dragged into the kingdom of God. He summarizes it all in his book, Surprised by Joy, but dragged into the kingdom of God. What does that sound like? And when he describes it, at the moment of conversion, he said it this way, at that moment what I heard was God saying, put down your gun and we'll talk. But the overall feeling here is that God himself decided that he was going to bring C.S. Lewis into this story and into this plan. You don't decide. Your father draws you in. We call this grace. Grace, 100% grace, all the way through grace, that you on your own, you'd be lost entirely. There's nothing that you could have done, but instead God on his own will, on his own steam, his own merit, pulls you in. We'd be lost eternally, but instead, what does God do? But he draws us in to his arms eternally. And this morning, we got to see God physically drawing in one of these children when, El Ray was, when Elroy was baptized. Did you see it? Did you see God drawing a child into his kingdom, pulling someone that otherwise, on his own, we know from Scripture, would have been able to do nothing on his own, to be holy and righteous in God's eyes, instead clothed in righteousness. You heard that repeated over and over again clothed in righteousness, made a fellow brother in our family. In response to the grumbling, to the focusing on bread and politics, Jesus said, your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. The greatest problem, and the new creation in us knows us, the greatest problem in this world is not politics. It is death. This is something that none of us will be able to escape. Death is the real issue. Regardless of what happens in this world, it will be a blink of an eye compared to eternity. Presidents, prime ministers, even dictators, they've got a few terms, a few decades, and then it's over. But eternity, the death that comes to all of us, that opens up those doors to eternity, is an issue for all people throughout all time, regardless of circumstances. But your father drew you in. He drew you in. And so we can look at our grumbling and we can say to God, I'm sorry. And our God says back to us, it's all good. Now let's work on grumbling a little less. What kind of a world will Elroy grow up in? What kind of a world, more importantly, will you tell Elroy that he's growing up in? Are you going to describe it to him as one that's spinning out of control, as a mess? Will you grumble to him about politics? Will you grumble to him about your work, about other people? Or are you going to tell him that everything will be all right? Because there is a God that is over all things, a real king. He proved it through what he did in his life here on earth, through his death and his resurrection. He is reigning now, and his promise is that he will never leave you or forsake you, and that he is working all things out for your good. Is that the message that you will raise Elroy up believing? Will you tell him, listen to Jesus, because he loves you, he draws you in, 
He's drawn you to the Father. He's decided upon you. And because of this, Jesus, in his own words here in the gospel, says to you and to you and to you and to Elroy, because you believe, you have everlasting life. Let's not be a church that grumbles so much. Let's be a church and grow as a church together that revels in our God, revels in our security, revels in our shared eternity in his grace. Amen. Please stand. And may the peace of God, the peace that is yours, because you are a child of God and your God is in control of all things, may this peace that transcends all understanding, may it dwell richly in your hearts and in your minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.